All right, Carla, come on up. Best introduction all day. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to try to make this quick since we are running late. First thing, and I wrote it this morning when we had cell phones going off, but I haven't heard any going off since then, so maybe we're okay with that. Um, I feel like I'm... That's okay. <laughs> okay. If you were here yesterday, you already know about Eric. He is one of the good lawyers. <laughs> Do you like that? <laughs> He's one of the good lawyers. One of his expertise areas is how a registered citizen is assessed. Some states use a risk base. Others use an offensive base. Most states use none. He will talk about what might work better, what doesn't work, but mostly what Massachusetts. Pretty close. I'm from Arkansas. Come on, give me a break. It may not be the best way, but it's better than most. Join me in giving a hand for Eric. So first, let me just um, echo the previous speakers and thanking you all for inviting me uh, to this conference. It's been great. It's been great to make some connections and talk to um, other lawyers. And um, I think it is a great opportunity for us to educate each other. And hopefully that's something I can do today. Because uh, one thing I've, I've learned, not just today, but um, just in learning about these laws over the years and in my practice, is that Massachusetts is not as bad as every place else. It's still bad. We still do things like registration and civil commitment, which I don't like, but the way we do it is not always as bad. And I always have clients who tell me, they get so frustrated with what's going on, and they say, I'm leaving the state. And I say, no, you're not. You are staying here. Because it's better here than when you cross the border. Um, so that's part of what I, that's, that's what I want to talk about today um, and give you some history about registration schemes and maybe explain a little bit why your state does it the way it does and then tell you a little bit about, about how we do it in Massachusetts um, and, and why there are some good aspects to it. There's pros and cons and we'll go through those and maybe some talking points and some ways to think about um, talking to legislature, legislators or other people and saying, you know, there's a smarter way or a better way or a cheaper way or whatever it is um, that might make your lives all a little easier. So I want to start by, um, by uh, a, a quote that um, I always like to talk about. Some of, some of you might know this one. It's a famous quote from Winston, Winston Churchill. And he said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others, right? <laughs> um, so I think that applies to what I'm talking about today. So risk-based registration schemes, which is what we have in Massachusetts, it's the worst form of classification except for all the others. <laughs> um, and we're going to... you on that? Yes, you can quote me. That's my name down there, so that's my quote. Um, so, and, so we're going to go through and talk about why that is. And I'm going to start by talking about what the difference is and, and um, what, it, what is a risk-based system, what is an offense-based system, how do they work, and why I think risk-based is a little better. Um, and again, let me be clear. I do not endorse the idea of registration. I don't like it. I don't think it should exist. And so I'm not up here uh, endorsing saying you need to do it the way we do it because that's just right and moral. I, I do not agree with that. But if it's you're going to do it, and unfortunately it's the reality right now, um, we can at least try and make it a little better. So let's just go a little bit um, as to sort of what the state of registration is today. Um, and you all know this, and we've heard about this many times already during this convention. 50 states, U.S. Ter territories, District of Columbia, Indian reservations, they all have some form of registration. And registration and notification, right? Those are two different things. One is you have to register, and then two is what they do with that information, how they notify the public. Um, and so under the Adam Walsh Act, and, and I'll give more detail, we'll talk about that, um, uh, and you've all heard about it, the federal government essentially provides funding to the states, and someone mentioned this already, to sort of give them incentive to have a, a registration scheme in their state. 
and, and they offer these national guidelines about how to identify and classify sex offenders. Um, now, the thing about the Adam Walsh Act and the money, which you already heard, it, it's an incentive, and a state does not have to do it, but a state normally wants to because they like federal money. Um, this is how a lot of things happen nationally. Um, you know, one of the bigger examples is you know, the reason we all have the same speed limit, the, the 65 mile per hour speed limit, is because the federal government gives highway money. And they say, if you want our highway money, you have to have a certain speed limit. And so states say, we want your money, so we'll have that speed limit. So it's the same thing with um, registration schemes to a certain extent, and we'll go through it. Um, so a lot of states, I say some states, but really a lot of states have modeled their schemes after the way the Adam Walsh Act says they should do it. Um, others haven't. Um, and so there, uh, there are different forms. They take different forms. So um, how do we get to the point we are today? It actually was through a series of federal laws that created these incentives. So Adam Walsh Act is the most recent ones, but there are ones that predated them. So the first one, you have the Jacob Wetterling Act in 1994. And um, uh, where you, uh, Jeff was saying how uh, he hated acts named after people. These are all acts named after people. So you have the Jacob Wetterling Act, the Drew, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. What is it? Sojourn, Sojourn Act. There's the Adam Walsh Act. Um, and then you have numerous state laws that have their own names, like Megan's Law, um, which was the way like New Jersey uh, created their registry. So these are uh, we'll go through these. These are all the different acts that have sort of given life to registration and, and given life to the schemes we have today. So let's start with the Jacob Wetterling Act um, in 1994. This was the first federal law related to registries, and, um, and that's what it was called. And what it did was, it was actually rather simple at the time. Um, it simply, and the next one, it just requires states to compile a list of individuals. Registration, right? Um, and convicted of certain sex offenses against children and required them to register for a period of, of 10 years. Now, one of the reasons we shouldn't name laws after people, um, it was a curious thing. Uh, the, the story about Jacob Wetterling was a very tragic thing. It was a horrible thing that happened. Um, it was an 11-year-old who was abducted. What we don't know is anything beyond that. And so why they connected that and assumed it was a sex offender and we had to register, I don't know. Um, but that's the life it took. But in any event, that was all it did. And so that was the beginning of this idea of registration. They didn't talk about notifying or publication or anything like that. They just said, you gotta compile a list, it'll help law enforcement, help authorities. Um, so that was 1994. Um, jump ahead to, to actually, um, we'll pause right there, but just to put things in context, and I'll talk about it. The, the Supreme Court cases that everyone's been talking about, the Doe cases, they happened right around this time or slightly just before this time. Okay, so just chronologically keep that in order. So the next act, the next federal act was the Drew Jodine Act in 2003. Um, and this created a national reg registry that took to all the different registries that the feds asked the states to create this was going to take them all together to make a national database so we could have one place for them. Um, and it created this, uh, this National Sex Offender Public Registry and then it was renamed in 2006 after her. Um, now again, naming an act after a person, um, again what happened to, to, to Drew was a very tragic thing. She was um, uh, abducted by a, a stranger. Um, and he was a registered offender but he was a stranger. And so, again, why that inspired this is not clear because this would not have helped her um, because she wouldn't have no, not known to look for a stranger. But in any event, that's what the federal law did. Again, through money and incentives, it said states, we want, we're, we're going to do this, you're going to create the registries, and we're going to make a national registry. Um, the next one. And so there is a website today. You can go to the website today, um, and it has links to all the different states. So someone mentioned this before. There's no federal registry. It's just this website with a link to all the different state registries. That's how they do it, by making the states collect the information for them. All right, so jump ahead to 2006, the Adam Walsh Act. Um, again, um, what happened to Adam Walsh was, was a very tragic thing, um, but we don't know a lot about the person that abducted um, Adam Walsh, and so again, we're not even sure if what we're creating through the Adam Walsh Act would have even helped Adam Walsh. 
Um, but in any event, Adam Walsh Act actually did a lot of different things. Registration is just one part of the Adam Walsh Act, so we'll focus on that now. Um, and what it did was it said, look, now that you guys are collecting all this information, you got to organize it in some sort of way. And we're going to tell you how you need to organize it, again, if you want our money. And so it created this idea of tiers. We're going to make you put people into different tiers, and it's going to be based on the crime they committed. And then the other thing it did, it, depending on what tier you're on, you had to register for different time periods. So this is the, this, the federal government said, we should have this all over the state. Everyone should have the same system. So states, we want you to do that, create tiers, and make people register in this way. And if you do that, you'll get the federal money for it. So since um, Adam Walsh went into effect, um, as of, actually, no, you might not have the new one. That's right. As of uh, 2014, uh, 2015, um, although that's still right. So there's 17 states that are totally compliant, basically doing everything that the federal government has asked them to do. Three territories, six, 63 tribes that they have found are in compliance. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that the other states don't have registries. We know they do. Um, some of them because they created them originally with the Jacob Wetterling Act. Um, a lot of them because they just did it on their own. They just had these registries. They just don't necessarily look like the ones that the federal government wanted them to do. So they're not all deemed in compliance with that. Um, and some states like Massachusetts, for example, we were registering people prior to Adam Walsh and we were classifying them prior to Adam Walsh. So we went our own way and some other states went their own way too. Um, here's one more thing about um, the Adam Walsh Act that a lot of people don't realize. There is written into the law, um, when it comes to getting states to comply and get the money, there's something written to Adam Walsh Act that says, if your state cannot comply because of state constitutional restrictions, so if you can't do a certain thing, such as register juveniles or make it retroactive because your state constitution prohibits it, then we'll exempt you from that and we'll say you're still in compliance. And so. I don't know how much that is known by states when they're trying to do this. And so if you have challenges, constitutional challenges, and, and states are worried that if that constitutional challenge comes forward, they're not going to get their money, you can educate them, say, no, no, it's fine. If the state constitution says we can't do it, the feds won't penalize us for it. And in fact, that's what happens in Massachusetts because our state constitution prohibits us from doing a lot of things that Adam Walsh wants them to do. So anyways, just keep that in mind. All right. So, so classification. Classification is the term we use for um, how to differentiate people who are registered. So whether it's modeled out after the Adam Walsh Act or has some other way, there are always normally going to be tiers or levels, a way of differentiating some offenders from others. Um, and there's always going to be a way to decide how we're going to differentiate between them. And so there's a couple of approaches to doing it, and most of you have just the way the Adam Walsh Act says to do it. Some of you have other ways. I've talked to some of you about some other ways. But it essentially boils down to two ideas. We're either going to register you based on what you did, your, your offense, so offense-based, and that's all we know is what you did tells us where you go, or we're going to register based on what sort of risk you pose. So it's not just what you did, but we, you know, we want to tell the public whether you're a low risk or a high risk. So that's called the risk base. So every scheme is going to fall into one or the other. It's either offense-based or risk-based. So let's talk about what that means. Let's start with offense-based. So this is the other case that went to the Supreme Court regarding registration that we haven't really talked about a lot. Everyone talks about the Alaska case and whether it's punishment or not. But this was the year before um, the Alaska case. And this was, a, Connecticut had a registry, presumably because of the Jacob Wetterling Act told them to do it. And uh, the, some of the people on the Connecticut registry brought a challenge saying, hey, wait a minute, There's, you're, you're denying me due process because you're putting me on this registry based just on what I did. Um, it's, and, and so basically they required you regardless of risk, to register. And so what is that? That is an offense-based system that Connecticut had. And they were saying, that, that can't be right. You should let me give you evidence to show you that I'm not dangerous or I'm not a risk. 
so I shouldn't be on there. And, they, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court saying, listen, this is a violation of my due process rights. It was a challenge to the constitutionality of offense-based system. And the court said, it's not. It's not a, a, a constitutional violation. And so this is the direct quote. The fact that the respondents, these are the people who had to register, seeks to prove that he is not currently dangerous is of no consequence under Connecticut's Megan's Laws. Um, as the website explains, the law requirements turn on an offender's conviction alone, a fact that a convicted, convicted offender has already had a procedurally safeguarded opportunity to contest. So what they were saying is, you have due process. You can tell them whether they got the offense right or not. So if they got the offense right, well, and if they got it wrong, you can tell them. And that's all the process you're entitled to. And, and you know, one thing about that, um, well, we, all right, yeah, so one thing about the Connecticut case and the Alaska case, um, you know, I think timing and circumstance means a lot. And those cases came out at a time when I think the court really believed what they said. I think they really believed that it wasn't punishment. This was sort of the beginning of the explosion of the internet. I don't think we really had a sense of how big the internet uh, was going to get and what it was going to do for registration. I think we didn't have the history of the, of the penalties and, and collateral consequences that came out of registration. Um, and so the court did these things, laying the groundwork for what we have today, um, not realizing perhaps the full extent of what was going to happen. Um, and I will come back to that point later. But in any event, so, so they did that. So um, going to the next slide. So they found no what they call procedural due process claim, meaning you got all the procedures that you were going to get, and it's constitutional in that sense. Um, there was a concurrence that left open the possibility of what they call substantive due process. Um, that issue has never reached the court, and so there might be a slight opening for attacking offense-based versus risk-based on a different due process prong that's a little, I won't, it, it's getting into the weeds to get into it right now. But anyway, so there's a, a tiny sliver of hope, but to the extent it got to the Supreme Court, they essentially blessed offense-based systems. And so by doing that, they essentially paved the way for the Adam Walsh Act to do what it did. So let's talk about what an offense-based system would look at. And I'm using the Adam Walsh example. Now, not everything's going to be exactly like this, but it's a good example because a lot of places are. Um, and, and if it, the definitions and time periods aren't exactly the same, you might have a scheme that looks like this in some fashion. And this is what an offense-based system blessed by the Supreme Court looks like. So you have, under Adam Walsh, you have three tiers. And you can sort of think of them as, as one, one, two, and three. One is the, the lowest tier, meaning the, 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 the least serious crimes and the least amount of time to register all the way up to three. So tier one sex offenders, for example, are those who are convicted of the least serious offenses and who are required to register for only 15 years and they only have to renew once annually in person. Um, and they're basically anyone who's not a two or a three. Not a lot of guidance. I don't totally know what that means. Um, there's not too many offenses that fall under that, although I, I assume there are some. Um, uh, but again, not having that in Massachusetts, I don't totally know how it plays out. But that's just how the feds want all the states to do it. So that would be a tier one offense. Tier two, the next tier, according to them, um, these are persons who are required to register for 25 years. They have to renew every six months in person, so more obligations as you move up to tiers. And the definition of a tier two offender is someone who's not a tier three, well, that seems obvious, um, <laughs> whose offense is punishable by imprisonment for more than a year and then involves, and it gives examples of the kinds of crimes it involves. So it is putting you in a tier based on the crime you committed, offense-based. Right? And so it looks to your crime and says, is it like one of these? I think it is. I'm going to put you in tier two. All right? It says nothing else other than that's the crime you committed. That's where you're going. Um, and then if you were a tier one and you commit a new crime, you move up to tier two. All right. And then tier three, again, according to Adam Walsh, which um, I call the most serious only because it has more obligations than the others. You have to register for life. You have to renew every three months in person. It's defined as punishable uh, for more than a year of incarceration and compared to all these horrible acts that you see there. Um, and so again, all it's saying is if you committed these 
you're going to be under this tier. All right? So this is an example of an offense-based system. So that's all right. So most states use this method today, or some form of this. If it's not the exact definitions of, that the federal government wants, it's pretty close to it. From what I've heard today, Texas uses that. From what I heard this weekend, I should say, Texas uses that. New Mexico, I don't know who else, Ohio. Um, what was that? Florida. Florida, yes, Florida uses that. Um, and so some states do it because the Adam Walsh Act asked them to do it. Some states did it before the Adam Walsh Act. So, uh, but for, for whatever incentive, for whatever reason, most states do it. Now, this is, you know, what I think is just so, um, you know, just the example of why this system is so silly. So remember Connecticut, the guy who they challenged it went up to the Supreme Court saying, look, our, our system, it, it's, it denies me due process because I, I can't prove what risk we are. And the court said, no, it's fine. Well, this is right from the Connecticut registry. Um, their Department of Public Safety, there's a big, when you go onto their registry to look people up, there's this big uh, uh, disclaimer there that says, the Department of Public Safety has not considered or assessed the specific risk of reoffense with regard to any individual prior to his or her inclusion within this registry. And they made no determination that any individual on the registry is currently dangerous. Individuals included are included solely by virtue of their conviction um, or court finding of state law, and the main purpose of, of providing this data on the internet is to make the information accessible to you and not to warn you about a specific individual. So I find that disclaimer rich. <laughs> what is the point of it if you're not going to do any of that? So the idea of registries, if you believe it, if you follow the theory, is giving the public information about people is supposed to be good for the public. It's supposed to promote public safety because they're learning something about persons. But what Connecticut is saying, can, can you stay, go back and stay in it for, what Connecticut is saying is we're not really giving you any information at all um, <laughs> other than what crime people were convicted of, but we're not telling you what risk they are. So now if you go on the Connecticut registry, you might see someone in tier three and say, all right, well, this person is in tier three, but I don't, what does that mean? What should I, you know, should I worry about this person or not? Um, and so that is ultimately, I think, the foolishness of, of registries generally, but even then, if you're going to do it, the foolishness of offense-based schemes, because it really doesn't do what they claim it does, and that is give the public some information. Right, for their safety. If you believe that is the purpose, then you want more information than simply what offense did you commit. Um, because then I can't tell the difference between one, two, or three, or anything like that. Okay, so that was an offense-based system of what it looks like. So let's slow down now a little bit, and we're going to talk about a risk-based system and what it does, what it's intended to do, and, and what we do in Massachusetts. So for one, it's a classification based on your actual risk, in theory. Right? In theory, we should be able to do an assessment um, that tells us if you are a risk to society or not, and a risk-based system is supposed to do that. There is a classifying body that is some entity that is in charge of doing that, and it's not just going to the police and then putting you on a tier. So it's a court or an administrative agency which makes a determination of what this level of risk is. And then once they determine that level of risk, that then corresponds to different things such as how long you should be on the registry, what information we should give to the public, if any, about you, um, how you have to register, whether in person or by mail or things such, such, like, you know, such as that. Um, so, uh, so, all right, so those are some of, the, um, some of the things it's supposed to do. All right, so there are, again, before I, I go down this slide. I don't endorse registration. Let's just make that clear, all right? This is not something that I am in favor of. But if you had to ask me, are there any good things about a risk-based system? I'd say, I can think of a few. And I can think of some bad things, too. And so we're going to go through the, what I think might be some of the benefits of it, and then what might be some of the drawbacks of it, OK? Um, so let's go through some of the pros, and then I'll, here's the list, and then we'll talk about it a little later. So one is more accurate. Again, what do, what do I mean by accurate? Well, if the idea is you're trying to give the public some information, 
than if you convey to the public information about someone's risk that is more accurate than simply putting someone on a tier based on what offense they committed, right? So this is going to give more accurate information if that is your goal. Number two, it's certainly more current. Um, and as I'll talk about, the idea of a risk assessment is that it's, it's evaluating your risk when you're being assessed today, not when you committed your offense or when you got a job, it's today. And in theory, again, I'll talk about this moving forward, it stays current. So if your risk changes, so does um, your classification, right? Otherwise, it would be pointless to have a, a classification that never changes um, even though your risk did. So it's more current. Again, this is all in theory. It's evidence-based. It's based on actual research. And there is a tremendous amount of research. And one thing that has, um, I don't want to say surprised me, but what I've become aware of in being here this week and, and this weekend and talking to people is um, how in jurisdictions where you don't have this, you don't know about the research. Or in lawyer, and, and, you know, why doesn't my lawyer know this? Because your lawyer doesn't need to know it because he's in a state where they just say, what were you convicted of? Um, but in reality, there is a lot of evidence. Um, you know, Janice talked about some in her, in her presentation. Carl Hansen, I know very well. Um, and, 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 and I have articles like this in my office, just stacks and stacks and research about everything you can imagine. Um, because this is not a new field. We've been studying sex offenders and recidivism for a long time. And how, and how do you know that? Because everyone who comes up here says rates of reoffending are very low. Where are they getting that from? From research. Um, so if you have a risk-based system, in theory you are doing that based on research, on what we know, and the research is pretty good for us, right? So that's a, that's a plus. So better information to the public I've talked about. If that is your goal as a as a state legislator or policymaker is to give the public some information, this is going to give them at least some better information and be able to help them discriminate between people for better or for worse. I have a question for you. Yeah. You say more current. How often are people being assessed? So I, I will get to that. Um, but, but to briefly answer your question, you get one assessment and then you are entitled to petition for a review every so often. Um, so there's a mechanism built into it that allows it to update. I should say, one way or the other, up or down. Um, okay, so better information. Procedural protections. Um, this is a pro in Massachusetts, and I can't say that if you had a risk-based system, it would automatically have protections, but it would have some just inherent in the idea that you're going through the process of assessing someone. That's certainly more than the, the, the person in Connecticut got, right? So. Just that idea is a procedural protection. Um, we have some more, and, and I'll talk about that. Um, and then it helps low-risk offenders, at least those who are classified as low-risk offenders, avoid some of the harsher consequences of those classified as high-risk offenders. Um, and let me pause here and say, um, this is also one of the, the things that irks me. Emily talked about this a little bit, about how you know we shouldn't just tell the easy stories, we should tell the hard stories too. And I, I agree with that so much. I, I, you know, this idea that you, you will have sympathy if you go to someone and say, do you know if you pee in public, you're going to be on the registry? And everyone's going to say, well, that's horrible. We shouldn't do that, right? And if you keep talking about all the easy ones, what you're doing is you're, you're carving all of these ones out, and then what you're left with is a core that's just indefensible at that point, right? And so I think we need to deal with the hard ones, too. One of the problems of this risk-based system is we are carving people out, um, and I'll talk about it a little more. As a lawyer, that is my job. My job is to carve out my clients and say, my client is different, you know, he shouldn't be the really bad one, it's everybody else. And in doing that, I am doing the thing that I don't want to do, which is differentiating between people. But unfortunately, that's just, I mean, that's part of my job, and it's just part of how these systems work. So a risk-based system does help low-risk offenders, but unfortunately, um, the flip side of that is it hurts the high-risk ones. Okay, so what are some of the cons? Um, it's still registration and classification. You're not going to get beyond that, right? It's still that and all the bad things we all think about that. So that's still there. It's not accurate if it's not updated, right? So it's good if we keep it current, but if we don't keep it current, then we're sort of running into the same problems we ran in before. Um, 
it can be based on bad science, bad research, um, and some of that is if the research has itself, um, if we have new research and we haven't applied it, then you might be basing it on some old information, so that's not good. And this is the counter of, of the low risk stuff. The public now puts more stock in a determination that someone's a high risk, because they say, well, this person has been through this process and it says he's a high risk. Um, and so that has a more meaningful um, uh, label to the public than just tier one, two, and three, and they don't know anything about it. So these are some of the cons. Um, and there's one more. Um, the categories, so in Massachusetts, these are the categories we use, and, and I'll talk about it in a little minute. Um, but they're sort of ambiguous, right? So tier one, two, three, I don't know what that means. Low risk, moderate risk, high risk, I don't know what that means either. It can be a little ambiguous. Was that a question? No. I have a question. The person, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just the question was, isn't it more subjective? Yeah, that's my question. Um, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> and also no and no. Because, um, well, we'll go through it and you'll see. There is subjectivity to it, but in theory, it's, the subjectivity is based on factors that are driven by research. So at the very least, you are, should be working from a pool of factors that we all agree either increase someone's risk or lower their risk, but factors that we agree the research says exist one way or the other. And from that pool, you're making a determination. So it's a little bit objective. It's a little bit subjective. Absolutely. But there's also human error. Somewhere there's along this... There's always human there's error. A, there's a person doing this that could make a mistake. The, there's always human error. We, as humans, are very bad at predicting what other humans are going to do, right? Because we're not robots. We don't know what other human beings are going to do. Um, and so we are very bad at predicting that behavior. And that's what this is being asked to do. It's being asked to predict someone's behavior to say, how dangerous are you? Are you? What does that mean is, do we think you're going to go out and offend? Well, how do we know what you're going to do tomorrow? Um, what we do know is that we have become better at predicting human behavior. And the reason we become better is because we've eliminated a lot of the really crappy ways we used to do it, right? So um, what do we used to do? Psychologists used to sit in a room with somebody and talk to them and say, God, this guy seems really dangerous. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to flunk him. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Well, that was based on nothing but their gut. And we did research and found out that that was as accurate as flipping a coin. Well, it's not very good, right? So that sparked a research revolution that said, well, let's come up with a better way. Maybe we can do some research. And we did, and we said, you know what? We took reoffense rates and this and that, and we found characteristics that were present more often with people who reoffended than those who didn't. And we created these tests that say, or these actuarials, they call them, um, that, you know, that are better than gut, right? So I can, I can look at you and do a risk assessment based on something that's been cross-tested by researchers, that's a lot better than using my gut. It's still not great. Actually, in fact, it's not very good. It's just better than the gut method, right? So, like I said before, it's the worst of all methods except for all others, right? So all we're doing is we're improving it a little bit. I'm certainly improving it more than flipping a coin and having you sit in front of me and guess whether or not you're dangerous. Not by much, because we just can't predict human behavior. That's just a shortcoming of, of humanity for, for now. Um, OK, so I'm going to use the Massachusetts example. Um, I think the way we do it is probably similar to only about two other states. There are other states that try and do a, I shouldn't say try, that, that, that do a risk-based approach, but they do it slightly differently. Um, so I don't know a lot about those. Arkansas, I was talking to um, someone today that they, they do somewhat some variation of this. Again, this is the minority of, of places, but I'm going to use Massachusetts because obviously that's what I know. So we have a risk-based approach. It comes, it's a combination, and we have a, a, the law that was passed that um, creates the registry board and creates this system. Then the registry board created regulations that govern what they do, so there's a lot of, of law that deals with this. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's also then this, our Supreme Judicial Court, which overlays constitutional protections from time to time that say some things they can or can't do. And they were partly responsible for creating the system we have when the law was first passed way back when. New York and New Jersey are pretty similar to Massachusetts in that they have this more sort of 
combination of objective, subjective, assessment. They're not totally the same. I think New York does it in court. I think New Jersey either does it in court or like we do, but it's pretty similar. And I don't know any other states that are similar to these three. Um, but so if you want to look for different examples, those are two example, two other places right now you can look at. Okay. So the goal of Massachusetts is at the very least to classify somebody, so that is determine what level of risk they are, before they're released for incarceration, or at least as soon as possible um, thereafter. Sometimes you might get a probation sentence, so obviously we're not going to do it before your sentence, but as soon as we can after. And so there are several stages to the process. You have a pre-hearing classification, which basically the board, um, actually, I'm going to, Right, so the pre-hearing classification where they will do some things and send you out a letter saying, we think you should be this level. Um, and if you like that level, you can keep it. And if you don't like it, you can then ask for a hearing to challenge it, the classification hearing. Is that before or after they've talked to you? Which part? The pre-hearing. Pre-hearing is based just on paper. All right, so they, they're, they're trying to shortcut the thing and say, can we, let's see if we all agree on what level you should be. And sometimes people do. So if we all agree we don't need a hearing or anything, we're all on the same page. So if you get a level one, great, you're happy. If you get a level three, you're gonna ask for a hearing. So pre-hearing, that happens. If you don't like it, you have a hearing. And then if you don't like the result of a hearing, there's post-hearing appeals, all right? And, and I'm gonna go through all that stuff now. Um, okay, so ultimately, um, your classification is going to put you at a certain level. That's what we call them. We call them levels. So level one, which I guess is the equivalent to tier one. I, I, don't, I don't even know how to compare them. But level one is, what, uh, is people who are found to be the least likely to um, offend, and they pose the least danger to the public. So that's what you're shooting for. right? You want to be a level one. Level two are those who are moderately likely to offend. I have no idea what that means. Um, and are moderate danger to the, to the public. Level three, highly likely to offend and a high danger to the public. And then there is, in theory, if you pose no risk, or what they actually, the term they use, if you pose no cognizable risk, you do not have to register. Um, that is something that can happen. It normally happens after you've registered for some wa a while and you say your risk has changed. And I have gotten people off the registry showing that they pose no cognizable risk. It is very rare, but I put it up there to show you it's possible. So your level determines, among other things, um, what, gets what gets given out to the public, what gets disseminated. Level one, public gets no information. That's really good, right? We all like that. That's why you want to be a level one. Now, the police get to know about you. Um, but the public doesn't. Even if they go ask, you don't get to know about level ones. You can be fairly anonymous. Level twos, um, prior to a change in the law in 2014, their information was only given out if you went to the police station and said, I would like to know everyone who lives or works in my town. The police would say, here are the level twos. They changed the law in 2014, and those persons now, level twos, are also on the internet. So at the very least, it calls them level twos compared to threes. But level twos are now on the internet, so they've expanded that in Massachusetts. Level threes always have been on the internet, and they also have what's called active dissemination, which sounds like what most of you have. We're going to go to the schools. We're going to post your picture up at the police station, the library, whatever it is. So level threes get the most dissemination. Um, and let me also just, the other thing about the levels, um, level twos and threes have to register in person and level ones only have to do it by mail. So the levels also affect how you have to register. Um, and everyone does it once a year, except for homeless that do it every 30 days, so similar. Um, but uh, in any event, so um, that's, that's the difference in the levels, and now you know what you're shooting for. So here's the pre-hearing classification process. This is what happens. So you get convicted, or you're about to get out of jail, or whatever it is, you get what they call a 30-day letter, and they say, send us any information you want us to consider. They're gathering their own information at the time, police reports, dockets, whatever it is, but you got 30 days to submit something. You then get a response from them at some point. It's an initial non-binding classification. So it says, we read what you sent us, and we read what we got, and we think you should be a level whatever. 
So if you don't mind the level they gave you, you can accept it, it goes into effect, and you're done. So that makes sense if you're a level one, right? It makes um, no sense if you're any other level. Unfortunately, a lot of people just accept things by default because they don't know, um, and that's a whole other area of litigation. But in any event, you can accept it if you want to, and some people do um, uh, for a variety of reasons. If you don't like it, you can appeal it in what they call a de novo hearing. And basically what that means is you get to, you get to go to a hearing um, and there's no presumption of what your level is and we're going to, at the hearing, determine what you should be. All right? And, by the way, this is the good thing about the law. If you appeal it, for, if you go to that hearing, while your case is pending in that hearing, you don't have an obligation to register with the police, there's no dissemination, Nothing. Even if they thought you should be a level three. While you're appealing that, they don't do that. That's probably unique to Massachusetts. I can't imagine a lot of places would do that, but that's just how we work. So that's a, another good reason to appeal um, if you don't like what you have. Um, okay, so that's the pre-hearing process. Let's assume you don't like your level, which most people don't. So now we're going to go to a hearing. So what does a hearing look like? For one, there are due process protections. These are the things that the, the person in Connecticut want, wanted that the Supreme Court wouldn't give him, that um, by virtue of our own court and, and other sources of law, you get at these hearings. So what do you have? You have a right to counsel. So you have a right to someone like me to, um, if you can't afford a lawyer, to be appointed. If you can afford a lawyer, you can pay me money to represent you. I would really like that. Um, and you have a right to have an attorney come and represent you at the hearing and put on a case for you. Um, if you have money, you can hire an expert. If you don't have money, you have the right to ask for money for an expert that sometimes you'll get for certain circumstances, but that the possibility exists. Um, compulsory process basically means you have the right to subpoena witnesses or documents if you need them. Um, doesn't happen often, but that right exists if you, if you want it. You have the right, I call it presented defense, but essentially present your case. You have a right to make an argument about what your risk should be or should not be. You can call witnesses. Um, I have lots of clients who I actually encourage to testify and who often do and do so very well. So you have a right to tell your story if you want. Um, and then the proceeding is governed by rules that we have in Massachusetts about administrative proceedings. So it's not bad. It's, a, it's, it's not a trial, but it's almost like a mini trial. Um, so what else? happens at the hearing. So the timing varies. I have sometimes waited. I have a case that I did in um, November, no, October, that I'm still waiting for a decision, um, which is unusual. But sometimes it can take a long time. Sometimes I get one in 30 days. So the timing varies. Um, uh, and it also varies in terms of how quick you get your hearing or how long it takes to you get your hearing. And obviously, you always want it to take as long as possible, right? Um, SOAR, that's what we call them, the Sex Offender Registry Board. They have an attorney at these hearings, so they submit their evidence um, to you prior to the hearing so you know what documents they're going to rely on. So that's a good thing. You have some notice. At the hearing, the, the, the board is represented by an, an in-house attorney, basically an attorney that works for the um, registry. And then the decision is supposed to be made by a quote-unquote neutral hearing examiner. I put that in quotes. Um, uh, because a lot of the hearing examiners are actual members. The Sex Offender Registry Board is a board, um, but there are some uh, contract persons. Um, and then, oh, there it's so, some board members. And then when, when they have a decision, they actually write it down. You get a written decision explaining all their reasons and all the things they're relying on. Um, so once that happens, so that's the process of the hearing. So once you get the decision, um, go to the next one. So that is now considered final. Um, once you get that in the mail, that is your level. That is your classification that they gave you. It goes into effect even if you're going to appeal it, unless you can get a court to stop it, which is very hard to do. Um, but it's a very detailed decision that explains what went on. So it explains the reasonings, whether they found the witness credible or not, evidentiary rulings, if you have made any objections, and it's supposed to be based on the regulations. So it really gives you something to dissect if you're going to appeal it. Um, again, think about the, the, the Supreme Court case where the guy was saying, I just want some due process. Um, there's a lot of due process in here. 
the burden of proof is on the board. So they have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence what your risk level is like. Um, that's largely meaningless because preponderance of the evidence is not very, um, uh, is not a very high burden. Um, and this doesn't have the, all right, this is on the new slide. So here, let me pause here on the burden of proof and talk about this idea of overturning dough. So a very interesting thing is happening in Massachusetts right now regarding the burden of proof. Our Supreme Judicial Court is hearing a case in September where the, uh, the, the petitioner, um, whose lawyer is a very smart lawyer and who I've worked with, he's saying that, look, the burden of proof should actually be higher. It should be what we lawyers call clear and convincing evidence. So it's sort of in between preponderance and beyond the reasonable doubt. But it's, it's, not, it's got some teeth to it. And he's saying the reason it should be higher is because when this statute first went into effect back in 1999 and our court reviewed it, our court said that standard is fine because there's not that much at risk, right? Very similar to this idea of is it punishment? Well, it's not punishment because not, it's not that bad, right? And what we have done, what this lawyer did, and, and I wrote a, a brief in support of it, said, so much has changed since you guys last decided that. Now there is so much more at risk that we never knew about that the standards should change because it should be harder for them to prove it so that you don't have all these consequences that no one envisioned. The proliferation of, of the internet, all these failure to register statutes, all these collateral consequences. It's kind of like saying it's, it's more punishment than you think. Um, and it's interesting because it's a very narrow issue, but it might be a window to doing more. Um, I think we're gonna lose, but I could be wrong. Um, we have a very good court and they decide to take the case for a reason. Um, so anyways, that, that, that might change, but that's what it is for the moment. Okay. Um, the board has the burden of proving both the level of risk, so what that means is how dangerous you are, is it a low, moderate, high, and then what danger you pose to the public. And what that really means is if you were to offend, what would it look like? Would it be a really uh, highly dangerous thing? I have no idea what that means. Moderately dangerous thing or a low dangerous thing. Um, and another thing about these hearings, hearsay is admissible if it's reliable. It's always reliable. They don't even need to call witnesses. They just put in a packet of police reports. That's largely because it's an administrative hearing. So, not everything is great about it, but there is a level um, in theory of protection there. All right, if you don't like that decision, you get a decision, you don't like it, you can still appeal that um, to our court. So you do have a right to appeal it to a court. Um, but the review is pretty limited. So if you lose at the hearing, you're probably gonna stay where you are, but you never know. Um, and it's the same uh, method of review that we would do for any agency. You don't get to put in new evidence, you just try and say there were some mistakes of law or whatever it is. Um, and again, the decision is in effect. Um, and if you want, you can then appeal that to an appeals court, to our Supreme Judicial Court, but um, again, really hard to undo. Okay, so that's what the hearing looks like. So the, the pre-hearing, hearing process, and the appeal process. All right, so what makes it risk-based? Well, there are factors that the board uses. They have these 24 factors and all these sub-factors that are based on research. They actually cite research in their factors um, as to what they're looking at. And they have what they call aggravated mitigating, which means factors that might make you more of a risk and factors that might make you less of a risk. And they list those in their classifications. Um, and then the ultimate decision is at the discretion of the hearing examiner. So they look at all these factors and they weigh them and say, here's some bad ones, here's some good ones. I believe this guy, I don't believe that guy. This is, this is what your risk is. There's no formula, there's no automatic level, so that's good and bad, right? It means everyone's got a shot. Um, it also means that who knows what's gonna go through that person's head when they put everything together. All right, so let's go through some of the pros. So like I said, an individualized determination, that's the first pro. That's not bad, right? Now you're judging me on who I am and not just on what my offense was. So I'll give you an example. If you know nothing more, first person, 20 years ago, he was two years older than his victim. Um, he committed an indecent assault and battery. Um, it was a brief moment. It was part of a childhood prank, right? But he was convicted of indecent assault and battery on a child. 
Second person, also convicted of the same crime. He was just released from prison. His offense was two years ago. It was month. He blames the victim. He was 20 years older. Right? Both convicted of the same crime. Under an offense-based system, they're both going to be the same level. None of those things matter. Um, but under a risk-based system, they're probably going to be different. Right? So I'm going to go to the... Yeah, so often they're both going to be the same no matter what, right? But under risk-based, um, the first offender is probably going to be a lower risk than the second one, probably, even though they committed the same crime. So that's not a bad thing, right? Not a bad thing. Um, more ac um, oh, All right, so there's one more, one slide that I'm making in there. So another thing, I think this is evidence that it's more accurate, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm just going to give you some stats. So as of the most recent stats of March of 2015, um, there were 2,000 some odd level one offenders in Massachusetts. There were 6,000 some odd level twos. And there were another 2,000 some odd level threes. Right? So about 23% are level ones. About 23% are level threes. And then about 54% are level twos. That's the whole state? Yes, we, it, there's 12. We're much smaller than Texas. I think we fit into Dallas. Um, so I think that's evidence that we're more accurate. Why do I say that? Because not everyone is in level three. It's not stacked to level three. And that's probably right. We know that's right, right? Because we know that most people are not high risk to reoffend. Here's some stats. Under Ohio, I, I was looking for an Adam Walsh Act place to get some stats. So under Ohio, in the most recent stats I could see, there's 41% in Tier 3, 55% in Tier 2, and only 13% in Tier 1. Right? So it's very different. So if you're just going on offense, there's a lot, of, a lot of Tier 3, what we would think are the most serious, 41%, right? But intuitively, we know that's wrong. And in Massachusetts, we see that's, that doesn't play out that way. So I think that's evidence that we're more accurate. Now, can I tell you whether everyone's on the right level or not? I, I don't know. But at least it seems like we're skewing in the right direction. All right, other pros. It's more current. So it's got to be present day, right? I got to know what your risk is today because that's the information I want the public to have. So it doesn't matter if your offense was 20 years ago and you're just getting out of prison today. I'm going to assess you today. What's going on? Right, do you have health problems? Are you older? Do you, you know, do you have family? Whatever it is, what's going on today? It's present day. And it's a combination of any factors you can think of, factors that don't change and factors that do change. So what we call static factors. Think, it's never going to change what your offense was. right? It's never going to change the gender of the victim or the age of the victim. That's always going to be the same. Uh, so if I evaluate today or in 20 years, that's not going to change. And if I only ever use that information, you would never change. Um, so we take that into account, but we take some other stuff too, what we call dynamic. Have you done treatment? Uh, are you, were you in compliance with probation? Who are you living with? Do you have family? Things like that. Things that do change. And things that hopefully we can say, you know, look at all the good things that are going on despite the factors that are never going to change. So it's more current. Um, all right, well, and then I'm missing this slide too. So the other reason, um, so you can be reclassified if your risk changes. And that's more in theory than in practice. Um, but in, you're all, everyone's eligible to be reclassified. You can't do it all the time. You're eligible to petition um, after, you've been, after, you've been on the, after you've been classified once every three years, you're eligible to petition to try and lower it. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do, and there's a long waiting list and backlog. But, so that's what I'm saying. It's, it's in theory, but it can happen, and I've helped a lot of people get their risks lowered and even all the way off the registry after an amount of time. Um, now, the flip side of that is that if, they, if you do something new, they can petition to increase your level. All right? So what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, but in theory, your, your risk will always be eligible to be reevaluated. What is stupid is that we don't make them automatically reevaluate everyone. So if you don't come forward, you could have been on the registry for 20 years, and you could you know, have been someone who's eligible to get off. But if you don't say something, they're not going to do it automatically. But it can happen. All right. Can you go back up if you petition? Can you? Um, in theory, that never happens. You're not going to petition if you've done something new or, or, or bad, right? You're only, hopefully, you're getting the advice that says you should just do it if, if you have a shot. 
Um, what are the other pros? Like I said before, it's evidence-based. So we have regulations that are based on, on this actual research that exists. Um, I'll try. I see the time, so I'm going to start trying to. Um, so you can introduce your own research, if you have it, for things that have changed since they last created the statute, or since, since they created the regulations. So for example, we have a lot of new research about females, about juveniles, about older offenders, about internet-only offenders. We know a lot more about them today than we did when these regulations were created back in 2001, I think. And so I can present that and say, look, you don't have this in your regulations. Let me tell you about my client that the research says is different. Again, I don't support the registry, but in theory, if you believe in it, it gives better information to the public, right? Because if it's more accurate, then they have more information to make some assessment from it. So again, go back to those two people who got charged with the same crime. Offense-based, if I'm Joe Q Public, I know nothing about these two other than they're in the same tier. But if I live in Massachusetts, I know one's a level three and one's a level one, you know, I probably don't have to be worried about the level one. So at least it gives that information to the public. Um, then there's these protections I talked about, and it's a combination of our constitution, our statutes, and just the workings of an administrative agency. So um, some of the things I already said, the individualized determination, right to counsel, introduce evidence, that kind of stuff. Um, statutory, so within the statute, the statute allows you to appeal. It gives the right to counsel if you can't afford somebody, the right to a hearing. It's not a public hearing. These are all things that are worked into the statute. And then administratively, you have these rules of evidence and stuff that I talked about. So there's a lot of different layers of procedural protections that, that occur. Um, helps low-risk offenders. So if you're a level one, you are not on the internet, you are not actively disseminated, um, nobody but the police knows about your information. That's, that's good for them, that really is good for them, and I have a lot of level one clients who do really well by themselves because they are able to live a fairly anonymous life. Um, they don't have to register in person with the police, that's good too, people hate doing that, and I understand why. Do they have compliance checks in Massachusetts? Um, they do. It depends on the city, so every police department is different, um, and it depends on your level. They're going to check on you. Uh, do they have compliance checks? Do the police come around and make sure you're living where you say you're living? Um, so it depends where you live and what your level is. Do you have to notify your employer that you're... Uh, nope. Nope. You don't have to do it regardless of your level. However, if you're a level three, they're going to find out. If you're level one, they won't. That's another good thing about, um, about having the option of having a level one. You can live a mostly anonymous life. Um, and it also avoids some of the more vindictive legislation because in Massachusetts, when we do something like, uh, we try and do like a resident restriction or something like that or prevent you from doing a certain job, we always, we leave it for the worst, right? We say, well, that's, this only applies to level twos and threes. So level one, they get sheltered from that. That's a good thing. What if you move from, let's say, Texas, you're a level one and you move there and you've got to classify it as a level two, are you going to be honored so we, if you move to Massachusetts, we are going to classify you our way. So you're, the tears from Texas mean nothing to us in Massachusetts because it tells me nothing about you other than what you were convicted of. So you would go through this process. Um, all right, so, so cons. It's still registration. It's what I said before, all right? So I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you still have to go through that. Um, it can be outdated. So our regulations were passed in 2001. A lot has changed, right? So some, uh, some of the science they're basing on actually is no longer any good. Um, there you go, it was adopted in 2001. And so we know a lot more about older offenders, about doing subjective or subjective assessment, juveniles, things like that. Um, and outdated science is bad science. Right? So, great, we're going to use science. Uh-oh, we're using old science. Um, and that's not good. And so you, we know some of these old assumptions that went into these regulations are no longer true. Um, you know, we know that people who deny their crimes, it has nothing to do with whether or not they're going to reoffend. But our regulations think it does because they were written in 2001. We know that there really is no real way to treat someone. So what do we know? Therapy can work in making your risk a little lower. We don't know why. We really don't know whether it's this, that, or just sitting in a group and listening to people talk. But our regulations think otherwise. We know that not everyone even needs to be in treatment. 
our regulations think otherwise. So bad science, it, it can happen. It can get stale unless it gets updated. Um, what, and we also we know this, right, that reoffense rates are much lower than we ever thought, and ever thought in 2001. High risk, if you're labeled a high risk under our system, now that's bad because everyone thinks, well, you went through this process. If they say you're a high risk, you're really a high risk. And so this is the opposite of the benefit of being a low risk. Um, those labels are presumptive, and that is a bad thing. And so the public really believes high risks are really dangerous persons, even though they may not be. Um, and like I said before, we're more willing to limit those people. Well, that's the person that can't live by the school, all right? And that's how we're going to judge it based on these levels. So these are some of the different things that we passed in Massachusetts based on just these higher risk levels. Um, all right. Here's the other problem. Even though we have these levels, low, moderate, high, it's still ambiguous. I don't still know what they mean, and it's not explained anywhere in the law. So is it a statistical thing? Does high mean that it's someone is 75% to reoffend and moderate is 50 or low is 25? Or, and this is what I think it is, and this is how I talk about it, well, high just means you're more of a risk than the moderate person. And moderate just means you're more of a risk than the low person. But, right, compared to each other, I can make some sense of it, but high might still only mean, you know, 20% risk, right? So the terms, they, we give the public that information, but then we don't define what it is. Um, and that's a bad thing. And, and I've, I've talked at a, at a there's a, we have a commission that's um, trying to study whether we should make any changes. And I talked at a commission recently, and I said, this is one of the problems. Because high might not mean what the public thinks it means. So you want to level people, that's fine. But tell them that high just means more than moderate. Um, and they're thinking about doing something, but I, I, I might have opened Pandora's box. It might be worse than been, what we have. Has there been any research done to look at the history of the, the level three people to see if they have offended more? Uh, no. Our board refuses to do any research to see if it's effective or not. Yeah. Um, we just, you know, I can tell you anecdotally and just knowing things, it, it's, it, we certainly don't have a problem with level three's offending because no matter what risk level you are, you're still not likely to reoffend, right? So every now and then there's a news story, this level blank offender reoffended. Of course it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyways, we don't know. We don't research it. Yeah. Exactly. No, but, but what we can do, I should say, what some psychologists believe they can do and do do is say, you're right, I, I, I can just I can take this study and try and apply it to this person, and this is my opinion of this person, and that's what they do. Yeah? Um, when I listen to this week, you talk about risk of a high risk or a, the risk of a level one, two, or three. Yeah. Is there any work to compare that to a non-registered citizen? Well, in theory, a non-registered citizen is someone who's not been convicted of, of a sex offense. So, I mean... But so, I mean, there, that risk wouldn't be zero. Well... Or else there wouldn't be no <laughs> You're right, but we don't know what... You know, we don't know what prevalence of the population offends and so, and, and why they do it. So I have, you know, we're all, if you haven't offended, you're, you are zero basically because we don't know more about you. All, our studies only talk about persons who have been offended, convicted. What do they do after that? That's as good as it's going to get. Five minutes. Yeah, I, I, I got like one more slide, so. Um, Carl Hansen's research basically says if, you have, if you've been in the community, yes. um, you know, 15 years, 17 years, and you haven't offended, you pose no more risk than anybody else in the community right. that never had. Jill Levinson did a study three years ago, came out, where she had four states, one state being Adam Walsh compliant, which was Florida, and the other three states were not, and they were tier-oriented, and she did a, this whole study. Right. And it showed that in Florida, we have a higher recidivism rate based on the way we're tearing our offenders, which is, and we were the AWA compliant state because it's offense-based. Right, because so, it's meaningless. Right. And, and one, we have no tier ones. Everyone's a tier right. one, tier three, and mostly everybody's a three. 
Yeah, and, and, and you know, so the, our board does take into account if you've been in the community. Um, it made more sense when we first passed the law and we were grandfathering people in, so we were evaluating people who had been out for a long time. Um, it is useful now if you have been registered and in the community for a certain amount of time. You can say, look, it's been 10 years, I've done nothing. Our regulations take that into account and are supposed to, in theory, move you down. I just want to read this quote. So I was saying that these levels can be ambiguous. Um, there was just a case where you know, we keep chipping away at this, and this is a dissent, so decide did not win. But an appeals court judge made this observation, and we all sort of perked up and said, that's right, that's what we've been saying. Um, and so what she said, she, she had a problem with the, the person being called a level three in that case, um, based on not much. And what she said was, there must, however, be an objective, quantitative basis for the particular classification. Otherwise, if we allow the terms low, moderate, and high to become separated from their quantitative core, a person could be classified as a level three high-risk offender, regardless of whether he presents a 5% risk of committing another sex offense or a 75% risk. This is unacceptable. Again, that, that side lost. But it's something that even the courts are starting to recognize that these levels have to be grounded in something. And we might be heading towards that in Massachusetts to start giving some legal meaning to these terms, low, moderate, and high, that might be very helpful um, for a lot of persons. Um, so, um, oh, all right, so one more slide that's missing. Um, one of the other cons I had uh, originally put in there, and, and thinking about it last night, I don't know if it's actually a con or not, but I put that it's costly, right? This costs money. Um, you have to pay for people to sit on the board. You have to pay for persons to make regulations. You have to pay for hearing examiners and lawyers. Um, and then I did some, some research, and, and the budget for SORB is $3.8 million, which upon reflection is not that much, right? Um, we're a small state. We only have, you know, 12,000 persons. Um, but $3.8 million is not a lot. Now, that doesn't count as, you know, that doesn't say how much we're paying the police officers to register persons, although you're still going to have to do that. It doesn't say how much you're paying lawyers to represent people, so it's probably a little more than that. But... So, you know, is that costly? I, you know, I put it down there as costly. Maybe it's not. And maybe you can, you know, talk to your legislators and say it doesn't cost as much as you think it costs to do all this. Um, so this is an old one because I had written a conclusion and that just has uh, 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 question marks there. But in any ways, um, you know, it's not, again, it's not ideal to have registration. But if you're going to have it, there are certainly better ways to do it than what a lot of you guys have. And Massachusetts, I think, is a good example. And if you ever need to point to a jurisdiction where they're doing it differently and without really any public safety consequences that I know of, we're a good state to point to. Were there any other questions? Yeah. An observation. You, um, you've mentioned multiple times that the offense-based systems don't identify risk. But the problem is there's a very strong public perception that they do. I, I, you see that in the press. Well, the so it's in, I don't know that they do. I mean, that quote from Connecticut tells you flat out, we're not assessing risk. So I, I don't know. I don't live in that jurisdiction. Well, well fair enough. Read the newspaper yeah. article that says, he's a tier three. Yeah. <laughs> so fair enough. I, I don't live in that jurisdiction, and that might be true, and that is a big problem with just throwing people on there based on just that offense. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um tomorrow morning the shuttle from the hotel back to this facility will leave the hotel at eight o'clock. 